Good evening, everybody. As always, welcome to French and Blessing Church's Wednesday evening Bible study. Today should be June 16th and our last just online Bible study while I'm on sabbatical. So if you are uh, normally you come to French and Blessing and Church to the building and uh, and you've been waiting for the end of the Just Online this next week, June 23rd. Pastor Jason will be in the building um, and online. So you guys are online. Don't worry, it'll still be online. But just a reminder, all you guys that, that normally would come to the building, that will begin this next week. So you're probably familiar uh, with the fact that, and I always say this, unless you're new with us, if you're new with us, then um, you will see, uh, this will be the first time that that uh, you see where we're actually studying in the biblical text, 2 Corinthians. So as always, you can check out our supporting material on our website, friendshipblessing.com. There's a reading plan and some other documents there that uh, give you an idea of, of how we're studying through the Bible. So grab your Bibles open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses, let's see, I've got it right here, 1 through 21, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 through 21. So remember, at the beginning of this little journey of just online, three weeks online, June 2nd, nights and then this evening the 16th i told you that mainly because of of the the time needed for study and all for me to study to prepare that they may be shorter i may go into one portion of the text uh not the whole text and that you would do some uh, that that it would mean that you would do some outside study. So I tell them, you know, every one of these chapters, portion of text, kind of went into that with that idea, and then I end up so much more to be gotten from it. So, but but this evening is going to be narrowed down just a little bit um, with our uh, with the text that we have. We're not going to go into everything. There's a kind of a gap in the middle there. We're not going to touch on but you can go back and study on your own. So, hey, before we get going, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. We rejoice. Give you praise for this moment, for life, the breath of life. Your word says, let everyone that has breath praise you. And we do, Father, we praise you uh, for the very breath of life we have, and then for all the abundance of other blessings that you have poured out on us. Father, we pause to commune with you for a moment, as always. Our greatest petition, our greatest request, Father, in this short prayer, is that your spirit would guide and lead us into your word and, to, uh, and into your truths that we need in our lives to walk closer to Jesus, to be more like you. May it be so tonight, Father, I pray this in the precious name of Jesus Amen. Okay. I guess I could have taken this out of uh, share screen there, but I wanted to go very quickly. Last week, I kind of started with some of the most popular verses. I'd say that this chapter, if you did the reading, you'll notice that it's the entirety of chapter five. The most uh, popular verse, you'll hear it more than anything else, is verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Incredible verse. Like I said, I think you'll hear it um, quoted more. You'll hear it talked about more from this text than just about anything else in this text. Now, that's not exactly the way I learned it. I, I'm old enough now that the most popular translation when I came to Christ and started studying the Bible was the King James uh, Version. But I think the ESV probably has it more like I learned it. And I really like this translation 
for this text. I'll tell you why in a second. But therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I think just this way of translating it, there's no doubt that the new creation is the one in Christ, right? The uh, here, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. There's like a gap there. You know, what does that mean? In the ESV translation, by the way, this is the NIV, the newer NIV translation, um, the ESV, and I didn't check the KJV, but I learned in that, so it's probably something close to this has this, he is a new creation to make sure that it's understood and clear that the one in Christ is the new creation. Now, if you go to the Greek, it's not there. That's why translations like the NIV and many others don't have that portion of the text in there. It's implied um, if, if, you go, if you go to the Greek, it's implied, but it's not there. So it would literally actually read more like this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. But it's implied that the new creation is the one in Christ. Um, so I just want to make sure that we all understand that you are, I am, a new creation in Christ Jesus. I don't do this a lot Wednesday night. I do it more on Sunday morning. But say this with me. I am a new creation. Did you say it? Hopefully. Hopefully you said it. Because then I just want to make sure that that's, that's what we understand. The New Living Translation, paraphrase, um, not uh, paraphrases aren't as tight to trying to keep original words so much as understanding. Uh, but I love this. Listen how this says it. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. And of course, I agree with that. I think that's an awesome way to put it. Um, that uh, it, our old is gone. And one of the reasons I think that's so important is in our modern Christianity, I see a lot of places where I'm not sure we understand that. It's like we have religion, we have Jesus, and that's pretty much what there is to it. The transforming power of the good news that brings a change in trajectory, in direction in my life. I was headed this way, now I'm headed that way with, with Jesus. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. So I said I'm going to limit it a little bit this evening, but there's two places that I want to go to. Let's go back to the beginning of the text now, chapter five. Um, and I'm going to do what I did last week, which is kind of read through the text, but then make commentary as we, we move along. So there's two places, I guess I would call them my favorite places, but as I read through this chapter that I want to zero in once again, because of the uh, limited time that I have um, to, to study with you this evening. But let me read verses one through four, and then I'm going to jump over to uh, eight through 10. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we, were in, we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Jump over to verse 8. We are confident, I say, and we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due, due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. I, I actually talk about this tension that Paul's talking about a lot. This isn't the only place, place that he brings this up, but let's uh, let's dissect it a little bit. Let's go a little bit deeper. First, my first impression here is, wow, what a hope. 
For we know that if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. You know what Paul's saying? saying he's saying to the church in Corinth, this isn't all there is to it. This, 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 this isn't all there is to it. There, there's way more. Now, remember, uh, just remember, we try to read into context a little bit, making sure we first understand who Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter, is speaking to. And he's talking about his suffering when he talks about this, right? Now, when he's talking about this earthly tent being destroyed, we'll get to that in a minute. What does he mean by earthly tent? I think you have enough of an idea that I can kind of start here. He's talking about his ministry his suffering, what he's been through. Um, and I was uh, over in chapter 11. You don't have to go there. I'll read it for you. You can if you want to, probably just a few pages over. Chapter 11, verse 23, he says, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus, lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. You can read the rest. But anyway, so when Paul's talking about this earthly tent that we live in being destroyed and the, all of this stuff, the physical, the material world, um, not being all there is to it, he has plenty of experience to come from. And by the way, all this stuff is happening in his life, all that negative, because of his having decided to follow Jesus. And they, they, it was persecution, the ramifications for making the decision to make Jesus the Lord of his life. So, and, and he's speaking into that to the people in Corinth. So, so uh, re, remember that. But the, I think the truth is the same for you and me. While he's speaking to them, I really believe that he's saying to them, same for them too, and all that we're going to talk about the, this evening. And, uh, and so here's what, kind of a little quick application. Whatever you're facing out there, this isn't all there is to it. This isn't all there is to it. So Paul said, earthly tent, this earthly tent, verse one, that remember that the apostle Paul is a tent maker. We know that from Acts chapter 18, verse three. And remember, I said what's cool about the Bible is it proves itself, meaning we can go to other biblical texts that were written at other times, and they mesh together, they fit together. So here, Paul saw him, uh, about the earth and tent. He was a tent maker. Acts chapter 18, verse 3 says, because he was a tent maker as they were, Aquila and Priscilla, he was with them. He stayed and worked with them. So we know that Paul was a, I won't go into all that, but he was, and it's probably what you imagine. He was a tent maker. So what is he referring to when he says, for we know if this earthly tent, we live in, this, he's talking about our bodies, right? I mean, it seems obvious, the physical world, our, our bodies. And um, I don't know about you, but my tent at 57 years old, has some issues. <laughs> so I'm grateful for the hope of this text, right? And, and not my relationship to Jesus hasn't brought the same kind of intense persecution and suffering that Paul's had. Um, but um, I'm beginning to feel at my age like this tent. It's got some repairs that, that it needs. So, so I know what he's uh, talking about when he says that. We have a tent. We have a home not built by human hands. So who built it? This reminded me of Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 1 through 4. I've always said this. And this is real interesting. We're not going to get hung up on this one text from the Gospel of John. But Jesus said, listen to this, chapter 14, 1 through 4. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place 
for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back, take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. So Jesus is going to prepare a place. You know, it'd be interesting is to go check out the Greek in that text or other translations. I wonder if it's possible if there aren't some that say, Jesus said, I'm going to build a place for you. I'm going to create this place for you. So, so, so Jesus is there building, creating, preparing this place for us. So if your tent has some issues, don't get discouraged. You have a home waiting for you that does not compare with anything here. It reminded me of a couple songs. First of all, one that I heard years ago, my grandmother, who was a believer at the time, introduced me to a singer way back then, um, and he, this was one of, um, of songs he sang all the time. And the, these are just words. Uh, the lyrics, I'm not going to sing. <laughs> I don't want to scare you away tonight. I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before. No sad goodbyes will there be spoken for time won't matter anymore. I hear the music in my head. There's, there's another one that I actually, I kind of was prepared on YouTube, bring it up, share it, whatever, so you could hear this quick, but I checked with my team and they, you got to, the, and they told me, no, I wouldn't share, you know, uh, what's on uh, YouTube or anything. So in lieu of that, I'm going to read some of the lyrics. My kids used to sing this song. It was a little kid song. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. I want to go there. We have a heavenly tent. It's not built with human hands. Um, so just remember, especially if you're facing something with your earthly tent. Now, let's jump over to... I actually read verse eight, but verse seven. I want to read verse seven because there's a connection here. For we live by faith, not by sight. Now, I just think Paul's connecting with what we finished up with last week over in chapter four, where he said, verse 17, so our light and momentary troubles are achieving for eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, verse 18, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So over here, verse seven, for we live by faith, not by sight. And remember, he's also talking about the earthly tent that gets destroyed and, uh, and the eternal things. I've said before, there's only two things that last forever. God, his word, and the souls of people, people do last. Everything else won't last forever, but those things. So we've got to be concerned about what is uh, unseen. Then verses 8 through 10 that I read to you, um, there, I talk about attention. I think I used the word attention. There is a tension here that I think is important because over here, Paul's saying, hey, you've got a heavenly home. You've got a heavenly tent. This one's breaking down, being destroyed. We live in a broken world, There's sickness and disease, right? We know all about that now. Um, but over, then he, he changed a little bit in verse eight. We're confident, I say, I would prefer to be away from the body. There's a better place. I, I'd rather not be here in a home with the Lord. Uh, but there's a but here. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear for the, before the judgment seat of Christ. I'll get to it in a minute, but Paul alludes to the same thing in Philippians, why I call it attention. It's the tension between wanting to be in heaven, but also loving life here um, and realizing that God has ministry for me while I'm here. I used to be on a committee. I think I spent like seven years in our local area of churches interviewing people that were going into the ministry. Usually by the point that I interviewed them, they were ready to be uh, ordained. I'll never forget one guy, a younger student who pointed out, it was good conversation. He just pointed out, he said, you know, you older guys, you're, um, you spend all your time on heaven. 
He said, the old songs are all about going, when we all get to heaven. The old songs are all about heaven. He said, and you talk about heaven all the time. You preach about heaven all the time. You talk about there. He said, you spend so much on, uh, time on heaven, it's almost like you don't do anything here. Reminded me, he may have even said this, but that phrase, uh, you can be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good, right? Uh, and, and so I think about that little conversation. There was some truth to it. Um, and from it was good to get his perspective on this. And Paul does say that. But so Paul says, I'd rather go home. I want to be home, but I don't give up in that. I don't, I don't quit on life. I don't, God's got me here. You'll hear, you've probably said as you've heard it said. So he's got a purpose for me. He's got a reason for me. And I'm going to live into that. I'm going to enjoy life and I'm going to live into life. I would rather go home to heaven, but while I'm here, I will serve the Lord, worship God, love others, and enjoy life. Um, and, and those are just quick phrases. So I said in Philippians, Paul said something uh, very similar. So let's take a look at it. Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, 23 20 through 25. I am torn between the two. I desire to part and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the tent in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress. Join the faith. I kind of always say to people, say, yeah, Paul said that he'd rather go home and be with the Lord, but so long as the Lord's got ministry, time for him to be here, he's going to stay here and be faithful. And um, and so that it's just, I wanted to point out that tension. So let's jump back to 2 Corinthians uh, 517, where we started. Remember, I said there's a lot in the middle. We're going to kind of miss out here, so we're jumping to the end. But I think these are the high points, and those are connectors, what you'll study there in the uh, in the middle. And, of course, I'm not going to read it all, all for you, You and you go read and study it. So, But picking up at verse 16, actually. So let me start there. So from now on, we regard no one with the worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us. Remember that word. Reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconcil reconciling the word to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So th there's a word. And, uh, and actually, um, Paul only uses, I think we only find this word reconciliation three different times, twice. And, and I don't mean like here we have it more than once, but it, this is the first time I think in time order for the apostle Paul that he uses the word uh, reconciliation. He's going to use it again in Romans and he uses it once more in a little bit different sense when it comes to marriage, I believe it is in that text. But first of all, here, here, here's what he said. You're a new creation. You've gone from eternal messed up to eternal fixed up, being fixed up with an eternal home tacked on to the end of it, right? So we're in this journey becoming more like Christ. Sanctification, it's called in the Bible. We've changed directions. And because of that, that's not all there is to it. So, this, so there's that. And because of that, then there's something else for me. But this isn't just about what I get, because I get that transformation, change in direction, eternal life, heavenly home, heavenly tent. But it isn't just about what I get. I say all the time that one of the dangers about all the good stuff that we get in Christ, God, is that in some ways it kind of leaves me where I'm kind of thinking that it's all about me, my relationship to God. Matter of fact, this whole idea that our faith is so personal has a real air of individualism to it. So it's my thing. It's my relationship. Stay out of it. I get what I get from God, and I'm good. In the biblical text, that's not the way it's painted. Matter of fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find anything that we get that's just like for me. It's just my thing. It turns into this thing that spreads in a different way, and Paul's talking about that. Uh, that here. So um, 
um, my relationship to God, my prayer, my needs, my life. It, it can be all about that, that stuff. Paul says you were reconciled to God through Christ. But this is not just that you were reconciled. Now you become a minister of reconciliation, a reconciler of source. So what does it mean to be reconciled? You're a new creation because you've been reconciled to God. Um, so we use the word a lot, I think, not in the biblical context. I think it's out there outside the church to be reconciled to someone. Marriages have to be reconciled. Remember I mentioned to you, though, that Paul uses this first here in 2 Corinthians. We also find it in Romans chapter 5, verse 10, and this really even helps us to understand what that word means. For if while we were God's enemies, that's very key here, Paul knew what this word meant. We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So what does it mean to be reconciled? Remember this word, enemies. I might even come back to it. It's about a change in our relationship. It's about a broken relationship being made whole. That's why I brought it up. We use it sometimes in the... Um, whole idea of marriage or friendships or whatever, reconciling to one another where there's been a broken relationship. So here's some phrases. Matter of fact, I may have gotten them from uh, Webster. I, I forget where I got it, but, um, and, and they're very biblical, too, close to the biblical understanding. The restoration of friendly relations. To be reconciled is to be restored to a friendship of harmony. Now, remember that this text says we were God's enemies. And you might think, I never been an enemy of God. If you understand the good news and really what the good news means, you'll realize that we were. And it was because of sin. Sim sin separates us from God. Now, you probably know the answer to this question, but who has sin? Romans 3.23 says, everyone has sin. What that means is, is that at some point we've all been enemies of God, and we were all in need of reconciliation of a restored relationship to God. And, and that's what it means to be reconciled. So through Jesus, you have had uh, your relationship. We have had our relationship to God restored, and now we're relationship restores. Um, matter of fact, the, the Bible says that we, we in that restoration come, because I know a lot of people like afraid of God, but the, the Bible tells us to come boldly before his throne of grace and mercy. That's a restored relationship. We're not enemies. And uh, so the, the power of, of that relationship, now we are relationship restorers. Remember that Paul's talking about himself and his ministry team in relationship to the Corinthian church, right? Um, but And I kind of always point us back to that direction. Verse 20, we are there for, right? He's talking about we are there for Christ's ambassador as though God were making his appeal through us. So he's talking about them, the ministers, to the church in Corinth. But I really believe that Paul understood that the people in Corinth would experience reconciliation and be ambassadors of reconciliation. And the same for us. It applies for us, too, that we've been restored to a relationship with God. Now we are relationship restorers. Uh, matter of fact, in... Um, yeah, well, I read verse 20 to you. It's clear there that, that uh, we are there for Christ's ambassadors. So you're actually, and I use that word a couple of times, I'll give an explanation. You're actually ambassadors of reconciliation. And if you go look at translation, you'll find out almost every translation uses the word ambassador, which is interesting because it's a word that you would think there'd be variations of how that's said. And maybe when it was translated in the King James Version in 1611 or previous to that, or since then, that was a popular word. And now and maybe it's not so popular. Almost every translation. So here's the Greek. Let's take a look at that. Here's the Greek means to act as an established statesman, a diplomat, 
a trusted, respected ambassador who's authorized to speak as God's emissary. Ancient phrase, I'm on embassy to the emperor. I'm an ambassador, someone respected as trustworthy, especially in opinions of those they know. I've kind of experienced this a little bit in my own life. Uh, many of you are aware that we lived in uh, Brazil for a number of years. And when we were in Brazil, it can be hard to explain this quick in quick fashion. But when we were in Brazil, we had problems with our visa. And it was serious problems. It wasn't, it wasn't any fault of our own. There'd been some miscommunication, uh, misunderstandings about our visa process and all. And, uh, and so what it resulted in was finding out that we had seven days to leave Brazil or we were going to be illegal. So what did I do? Contact me. There wasn't an embassy where there was an ambassador in the city we lived in, in the Amazon jungle. There was a consulate. Actually, it was kind of an outpost. Um, but the, the guy in charge was sort of a consular. I think maybe that's even what he was. So sort of an ambassador in that location. And he went to work for us. We contacted him. He went to work for us. He had authority uh, from the United States. Um, the, uh, he was an American consular. And he had authority in Brazil, in that country, to speak in ways that we could not and to repair our relationship. Anyway, throughout that process, he was actually able, um, it took quite a process, but he was able to restore and repair our relationship to Brazil. So you're here on earth, but you have another home. You have authority from that home, heaven, to repair relationships. Say, I am an ambassador for Christ. I'm an ambassador of reconciliation. Whole other Bible study as to all the things that means and, and how to be an ambassador of rec reconciliation. But suffice it to say, because I, I need to finish here. Suffice it to say that the first step is realizing that I have been reconciled to God and my relationship with him is more than just about me. I've got this ministry. <clears throat> now, Friendship Wesleyan Church, I may have said in the last Bible study, or maybe I, I didn't even say it Wednesday night, but at Friendship Wesleyan Church, we say every member a minister. What that means is if you're a follower, follower of Christ, then you have a ministry. God has given you a ministry. So you're a minister, not just pastors. You're, you're a minister. You may have a different gifting to do your ministry than like I do as a pastor and preacher, but God has given you a ministry. So every member, a minister. So you have a ministry, and it's the ministry of reconciliations to be a part in restoring relationships. First of all, people for God. So maybe here's a starting point. Start by praying for those people you know who need to be reconciled to God. Maybe you don't know, you're intimidated, you don't know how to talk to people about God. Just start by praying, praying that they would be reconciled to God. And those who need to be reconciled to each other, because there's a whole another piece to that that I think is really cool as followers of Christ. Because I think a byproduct of being reconciled to God is being reconciled to each other, restored marriages, restored relationships, parent to kid, grandparent, all these relations. I think that as we become reconciled to God, then the, the God's power in our life, the transformation flows out into our relationships too. So start with, start with prayer and, uh, and asking God to show you how to be an ambassador of reconciliation. And remember, remember, it's the, the remembering key things, right? Remember, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has come. The new has here. You are a new creation. Let's pray. Father, I just am so grateful that you find us worthy. Father, we were still sinners when Christ died for us. So we're unworthy in that sense, but you found us worthy. You've loved us. And that while we were still broken, messed up, you sent your son to die for us, that we could be restored in relationship to you. We were enemies, 
Thank you, Father, for bringing us into friendship, into a friendly relationship. We're just like we're doing right now. And everybody out there who's watching that's a follower of Christ can boldly come before your throne of grace and mercy. And we're, thank you for that restored relationship. Now, Father, probably most of us kind of awkward <laughs> at understanding exactly how then and how we're supposed to help others be restored in relationship to you and to one another. But Father, the joy of being in right relationship to you and the realization that it's not just about me in relationship to you, but that Father, you've got us here where this earthly tent is being destroyed through brokenness and time and disease in this sin-filled world, that you got us here as ministers of reconciliation. So we pray. We pray for those that we know that do not know you, that they would make your son Jesus Lord of their lives, that they would repent of their sin, they would have that relationship restored. We pray for those around us. Maybe we're in a relationship that's hurting, that's in need of being reconciled transform us in a way that we see the need for that and we can step out there father in your wisdom and do what you called us to do to be ambassadors in this world we love you give you thanks in jesus precious name amen okay so the next few weeks it's pastor jason and then i will see you in house and online would we say july 14th i think so if I got that wrong, you make sure you check the dates because I don't have it in my notes. Hey, have a God week. God bless you.